and we will just get right to it with our technology fellow, Mr. Kerry Holly. will come, come join me on stage. Kerry. <laughs> that's uh, launched. This is sort of a prelude to all of the topics you see there. But I wanted to start off with, uh, well, actually before I do this, let me do a plug for tomorrow. Tomorrow we have the uh, all hands the, uh, uh, at 8 to 10 and uh, just a question, just if you would keep your hands up for five seconds. How many of you are TLCP accredited? Keep the hands up, keep the hands up. So I would estimate that's maybe 30% of the crowd. That's way too low, so let's fix that. Anyway, let's go on to our topic at hand. Take a look, read, read, what you, read, read this uh, story for a minute. What do you draw from this? Give me some conclusions. What do you draw from this? Opportunity. Opportunity, what else? By the way, a hint is the subheading. We're not, we're not here, we're not on the topic as well. So. I'm gonna get there, hold on that one. <laughs> they didn't meet the requirement. <laughs> I didn't meet the requirements. So the story I think that's told here is that it's a tale of two citizens. We have the immigrants, the digital immigrants, and we have the natives. Who are the immigrants in this picture? IBM and, and Oracle. These are two companies that simply have not adopted as fast as they should into all of the emerging technologies that started with the days of the internet till today. And this is the result of that. This has been a 10 year cycle of decline. What does this tell you? Well, we got lumped in with IBM. <laughs> Say that one more time. We got lumped in with IBM. Why did, we, why did I lump us in with IBM? <laughs> Now, it's not because I've worked for both companies, just so you know. But maybe there's a hidden story there. It's because I have some lessons learned from having a stellar career at IBM and observing what I observe in this great company, which I picture at the same tra trajectory as IBM. But the point is that I think that all of us have to make sure that this doesn't happen, that this headline never appears in 2025 or 2024 that we, because we are a digital immigrant, that we adopt the practices of a digital native. And in order to do that, there's a ton of technologies that we must address. But I'm gonna focus on a narrow set. But before I focus on that narrow set, we are of two minds in my opinion. I profess, I state the following hypothesis, that artificial intelligence is a set of technologies, it's a field of study, but that's not the hypothesis. The hypothesis is that it's a general purpose technology. And as a general purpose technology, it changes the way we live, work, and play. As a general purpose technology, I am suggesting, I am advocating, I am proposing, I am stating as a hypothesis that it will be as important or more than the computer itself. And the computer is a general purpose technology. And that is the hypothesis I'm leading with. I am not saying it's there today, but neither was the computer when it was first introduced in the 40s or or 50s, it was not something that changed the way we live, work, and play. What makes something a general purpose technology? It gets better and better and better every year. It has a profound impact on economies. And we're seeing the evident, evidence of this today. We're seeing it by nations who are proclaiming, like China and Russia, that those who rule AI will rule the world. We're seeing nations establish strategies on how to employ AI. We're seeing our current and future competitors embrace AI as a way of doing business who have taken an AI-first approach. But what are we faced with in our world? In our world, the world I live in now here at UHG, this is the world I see. I see it from some of you who debate and argue, why are you talking about machine learning? I can write a five page rule much faster, much cheaper. And all of that is done without concern for the amount of technical debt that we incur. All of that's unconcerned with the lack of agility that we impose. All of that is unconcerned with the fact that our product, that our competitors are not taking that approach. And we can look at Google, their rules of machine learning. 
let's always start with machine learning first. And then if that's not appropriate, let's back off. So I think that this is a, uh, this AI first approach is, a, is an interesting one. I was on the phone today with, uh, uh, with a non-technologist uh, from Population Health. And the question he asked me, he says, well, Carrie, isn't AI just analytics? Isn't it just doing prediction models? Isn't it just doing linear regression? Isn't it just math? And I said, well, that's almost like saying that the cloud, because I built it on Java, is just Java. Well, yeah, it's got these underlying technologies, but I would assert that analytics is fused, infused, rather, by AI, but analytics and AI, AI are not the same. AI has a strong flavor of software engineering, and just because we're not exercising that muscle today, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. AI is a lot more than building models. If you've looked at Google's technical debt article, you'll see that the models, maybe it's 20% of the solution. So why this conversation? I'm also suggesting that all of us need to have some level of fluency in machine learning. Yes, I'm suggesting we hit the books, take the Udacity courses, that we look at a change that is occurring that requires us to retool and reskill ourselves. I am not saying, I'm not saying that we should abandon anything that we're doing today. I'm not saying that the future is here now. I'm simply asserting there's an opportunity to do better. There's an opportunity to create a wow factor in our products, a wow factor in our services and our capabilities and it requires table sticks. I would assert that mobility, cloud, the internet are table sticks. We must, ma and agile, we must master these, but they are table sticks. But this general purpose technology, I would assert, is key. I just wanted to have this conversation in case uh, some of you have seen me talk through this before. But let's just have a meeting of the minds on how I would like to talk about artificial intelligence. I'm describing it in waves, and I'm describing it this way, not because I wanna hijack what AI means, not because I wanna be a terrorist and say this is AI and this is not, but instead to have a conversation that expands our horizons and thinking. So we have embraced artificial intelligence when I say we, the com this company and uh, the industry at large for quite some time. From an industry standpoint, we know that this emerged in the 50s. And I'm describing this as wave zero because what we did in this early stages of AI was a lot of custom stuff, whether it was custom engineering of hardware, whether it was custom engineering of uh, software. We used the basic map, not the basic map, but the more complex map that we use today. We had statistics, we had the uh, actuaries, uh, we had data scientists, we've had this actually for, for decades. And this is all great. And this is what we often describe as classical AI. And I'm not suggesting that some problems that we deal with shouldn't still use classical AI, they should. <coughs> so, the iconic display, I would say, of classical AI was, and this may date me and some of you, I'm still a kid at this point, but just so we're, we're clear. <laughs> When checker, when, when, the, when a computer could first play checkers, that was like a seminal event in our industry uh, back in the early 60s. And then, of course, we saw IBM Big Blue beat Gary Kasparov in chess. That was, I would argue, an, an iconic display of wave zero. No machine learning, all rules-based, all custom coding, all engineered hardware. Then if we go further, we saw an AI winner. Why did this AI winner occur? It occurred because the promises, the promises of AI were unfulfilled. We built systems, we built a tremendous amount of rules-based systems, decision support systems. We used tools like SAS and others, but those systems were hard to maintain. And when the business model changed, when the landscape changed, 
it was a tremendous cost in terms of time and resources to modify those systems. And then secondly, the whole field of AI was based on being inspired by the human brain and people, and none of these promises were being fulfilled. A winter ensued. What do I mean by a winter? Investment dried up. Less and less research was being done. Industry was abandoning it. And we saw very little progress uh, during this winter. Then we had wave one occur, and we had a resurgence. And this is when we saw uh, more and more organizations, largely initially around fraud, we saw this in the financial industry, we've seen it here with payment integrity and others. We started seeing that, and, and with just prediction models, that we could do a lot better by using machine learning. And so we invested heavily in machine learning. This organization, awesome in its use of analytics, its use of machine learning, grew and built some really outstanding products as a result. But again, I would argue this was wave one. Iconic display of wave one, I would assert, was 2011. Not that the iconic display started in 2011, or rather the wave one didn't start in 2011. The iconic display was a 2011 event, was, which was IBM's Jeopardy win. That I would say. And just so you're clear about that technology, that technology didn't use any GPUs. That technology didn't use any machine learning. It used a lot of NLP, no NLU. It was a very basic solution. I shouldn't say it used no ML. It did use machine learning, and I apologize. It didn't use any deep learning, is what I meant to say. So that's why I'm describing it as a wave one. No NLU, no deep learning. Another winter ensued. Now I know the timeline's a little off here because it, you know, the IBM iconic display of Jeopardy was 2011, but I'm just using that as an iconic display, not, the, not a timeline scenario. But then we had another winter ensue after this wave one. And this next winter lasted until a couple of events occurred. They didn't all occur at the same time, they were accumulating. One of those was, of course, the internet caused us to have just an explosion of data. We also had, from the gaming community, and NVIDIA, and the arrival of GPUs. And of course, we had this little known algorithm called backpropagation. So you put all these three things together and suddenly, professors who for 15 years couldn't find work are now being paid over half a million dollars for their expertise in neural networks. So that's a, that's a change that's occurred. And the winter is over, and now we have wave two. I'm asserting that our opportunity for awesome products lies in leveraging wave two technologies. And I'm also arguing that, as I said, to start the conversation, this is a general purpose technology. It's gonna get better. What we're seeing now, which is a lot of correlation, we're gonna to get to causation. If you haven't read The Book of Why, order it, read it. The Book of Why, I believe, gives a blueprint of where we're going with, and written by one of the world's esteemed computer scientists. I can thank Dan and the audience for alerting me to the book. But The Book of Why is an awesome book to read in terms of where we're going. So wave two, I had this debate with Gardner. I know some of you were present when we had this debate, because they, at least one of their analysts, was arguing that the winter is coming for wave two. And I don't believe the winter is coming at all. I believe the trough of disillusionment is coming. And in fact, it's already arrived in some parts of our company. And you understand the distinction, I hope. The trough of disillusionment says that the hype curve of AI is, there's a gap between it and what's actually being delivered. Yes, I do believe that trough of disillusionment is occurring, but we have an opportunity to close that so that it doesn't occur. That's our opportunity. But what is not happening is the investment by industry, the investment by academia has no line of sight being slowed down. The growth of the technology has no line of sight as being slowed down. That's why there will not be a winter. 
of nations, the amount of investment. If we look at China and what's occurring in China, we should be impressed, surprised, scared. The advancements that they're making in AI would blow us away. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, not about China, but some of these advancements. So I'm asserting that there are still solutions where classical AI, wave zero applies, and there's others where wave one applies, but we really should be looking at opportunities to exploit wave two. One of our executives, uh, who I won't name, in the business side, not in Optum Tech, said that AI overpromises and underdelivers. Another observation, because wave two is so relatively new, I don't believe that there's a tremendous number of third parties that are well versed in the technologies. The conflation that you see is significant. That is, organizations that are selling AI to our business stakeholders conflate wave zero, wave one, and wave two. Why is that conflation significant or bothersome? It's bothersome because some problems can't be solved with wave zero and wave one. You need wave two. If they don't know the difference, if they're not fluent in the architectures of convolutional neural networks, if they're not fluent in the libraries like TensorFlow, if they're not fluent in the research that's required, we are at the early stages. This is an example. I don't know if all of you know Dima Rakesh. But Dima Rakesh, uh, sitting in the audience here, is one of our senior DEs. When we both arrived in this organization two and a half years ago, we could find no GPUs in use at the company. And GPUs are not like CPUs. They're different technology. And in order to do basic things that you and I are accustomed to, like multi-threading, um, uh, and you know, to, 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 to be un aware that behind the scenes I'm using the GPU. Dima had to write code. He had to make that possible in this environment. We are at the early stages. Even today, uh, I don't know if John's in the audience, but John Centelli will back me up on this. I'm trying to get more GPUs installed in this environment. And yet, the arguments I have is like a chicken and egg. Because I have some saying, well, why do we need them? You're the only guys using them in ATC. Well, yeah, we're the only ones using them because we can't get critical mass unless we start having the hardware to prove the solutions to get critical mass. But these arguments are not being held by our competitors. Our competitors have a GPU on the desk of every engineer. How many of you have a GPU on your desktop? Galena, I know you have one, but... <laughs> you see the problem. This is not how we become a technology company. So I say this to you not as a criticism, but every voice I can get to go back to their management and say we need more GPUs, we need more, 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 is a voice I welcome. And, I, and, I, and I'm not saying that AI is a silver bullet. I hope you walk away with that. I'm simply saying it's a technology we need to get ahead of. We need to be able to democratize and mainstream the technology. And every time I say that, some people think I'm talking about deep learning models. I'm not talking about deep learning models. That's just one tool. I'm talking about how do we deal with model drift? How do we deal with causality? How do we, how do we create an environment where just like a self-driving car, it can take data on the fly and adapt and change? How do we create decision support systems that predict? How do we predict the, what the caller wants in the next call before the caller even knows it? The same way that we can predict in Netflix what movies you might want to watch. We can do this today. <clears throat> we just have the will. We just need the will and the sponsorship to make it happen. So I agree with the statement that when working with third parties, we may walk away with this notion that AI overpromises under delivers. I only ask that all of us understand that we have some brilliant people in this company, truly brilliant people, and we just need to know who they are and tap into them and allow them to lift all of us to a higher plane of capabilities and delivery. And they live, by the way, in all parts of our organization. They live in 
in, um, in Frankie's organization. They live, live in Bernard's organization. They live in Francois's organization. Uh, so we have a tremendous amount of talent. I do think applications are getting more intelligent. And no, I don't see this fully today. But I do think this is where we're headed. And when I say intelligent, I'm saying that we will have systems that use voice, systems that use images, whether they're coming from sensors or cameras. Uh, we will have systems that use um, uh, uh, personalized algorithms. Uh, we will have systems that use devices that detect our emotions. We will have systems that have devices that detect our gestures. We will have systems that will do phenomenal things. And at the heart of that, today will be a deep learning neural network. Tomorrow, who knows where the invention will go. And it's because we will embrace software as a service. It's because we will embrace mobile and cloud and it's because data will come from a variety of, of approaches. I only share this slide with you to emphasize a message that we've known for some time, that the more we invest in our core systems, and just so I can make a preface here, I'm not saying we shouldn't invest in our core systems, just so we're clear. But the more we invest in our core system, that's like staying afloat. It does not move the needle in terms of sales, in terms of revenue. And I, I can't say factually that's true for this company, but I know in my prior life, in the time I spent in IBM research, we knew this was true for the dominant number of Fortune 100 companies, that enterprise value since 2013 has not been coming from maintaining, enhancing legacy systems. And I don't care if you built that legacy system just seven years ago. Enhancement has, and value has been achieved on building systems that extend beyond the walls of the enterprise, that create more engaging value, more engaging experiences. This is where we've seen value. I quote Andrew Whitty because I think that's consistent with the point of view I'm making, which is that we delude ourselves if we think that we are making a difference. He didn't say this, but healthcare, when the predominant amount of systems we have are back office administrative. We've got to do more to make people healthier. And I believe the opportunity to make people healthier comes as we embrace these new technologies and start building intelligent systems. This is sort of a heavy picture, but simply trying to show that these technologies can play successfully together. We can build systems that use things. We can have chats that are voice driven. We can have chats that are predictive, and not just, we can actually do a next best action. And by the way, all of these slides are downloadable today, now. Uh, if any of you have visited the ATC Hub, they're all there. You can download this at any point in time. All, so just, I'm happy for you to take pictures, but I just want you to know the slides are available now. So the point is that all of these technologies play a role, whether it's graph, whether it's NLU, deep learning, these all play a role. Our challenge is to help our stakeholders see the opportunities when these technologies are played together. And this goes back to this picture, you know, that we're building intelligent systems. And these intelligent systems are using these technologies in a meaningful way. And again, I can't emphasize enough, I'm not talking silver bullets. I'm simply saying we're at the early stages. This picture is, is uh, adapted directly from the Book of Why. And I share you this picture because I loved it, number one. Number two, because I think what Daniel Pearl articulated is spot on. That, you know, what does my symptom tell me about my disease? If I take an aspirin, will I feel better? What if we ban cigarettes? What if we eliminate claim systems? Could we still process claims? He didn't say that, by the way. I added that little nuance. <laughs> but the point is that I do think we can build more intelligent systems. And we just have to imagine what they look like and what they are. And what do my symptoms tell me about my prescriptions? If I take an aspirin, will I actually feel better? Causality, not correlation, causality. This is where we're headed. And no wait times, 
Medication's always in stock. I know this is sort of an OptumRx story. I hope Francois likes it. <laughs> but uh, this, is, this is where we can go. I think this is the end game of our competitors, is ambient computing. Ambient computing uh, requires all the technologies I briefly mentioned. Ambient computing says that we live in a world that's contextual. We live in a world that senses our presence and responds accordingly. A world that not only senses our presence, it begins to sense what we're doing and responds accordingly. That, I think, is our opportunity. Our world is changing in the following way. We have three worlds that are coming together. You and I build systems. That's, that's the world of business and IT. We have a physical world that we all live in. Who's not wearing a wearable here? If you've got a mobile, you're, you've got a wearable. We're all becoming instrumented. And the physical world, our human world, whether it's through social networks or it's through other instrumentation, these three worlds are coming together. This is what's fueling ambient computing. Thank you very much.